Why is this couple smiling? Perhaps they found hope, meaning, and purpose in the Book of Revelation. Nearly 2,000 years ago, a lonely man on a distant island received a remarkable vision. Some readers have been frightened by his vision, but many more have found in it the hope, meaning, and purpose they were looking for. And now, here are your hosts, Dr. John Pauline and Dr. Graham Bradford. Hi, I'm John Pauline. And I'm Graham Bradford. And I want to welcome you to Revelation, Hope, Meaning, Purpose. I was just thinking, Graham, uh, where'd you get that funny accent? John, I don't have an accent. You have an accent. That's the first time I ever heard that. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, I can understand you. That's the main thing, isn't it? All right. Well, where are you from? I'm from Melbourne in Australia, home of Aussie Rules football. And we are the best in the world, John. Oh, does that mean you're the only ones in the yeah, world that play it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I have to admit it. <laughs> well, I grew up uh, in New York City, which is uh, the opposite end of the world from uh, where Aussie rules football is played. And I never heard of it until I was about 40 years old. And uh, since then, I have moved to Loma Linda University, where I'm dean of the School of Religion. And uh, we have a health science university there where faith is built in to everything that we do in medicine, dentistry, and so forth. So that brings me to today's world and, you know, what's the book of Revelation all about and why should anyone care? All right. I think there's a lot of interest today in the book of Revelation and uh, Hollywood takes it up as a theme. I think people are feeling insecure. They're wondering about, will this world really survive? But John, you're an authority. You've written on this. You've written on The Lion King and Hollywood's interest. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah. Well, I, I, it's fascinating to me how much uh, the themes of the book of Revelation do come up uh, in the movie industry today. Uh, you mentioned Lion King. Uh, the book of Revelation is actually a lot like that. It's an animal story, and yet it's not really about animals. In fact, it's about a perfect world that gets ruined and then uh, it gets restored through the actions of a son and so forth. And uh, it's sort of an apocalypse. The book mm. of Revelation is an apocalypse talking about big themes uh, using this as symbols, animals, and, uh, and similar things. It's quite amazing. It seems like all through the centuries, every generation has found hope, meaning, and purpose from this book. Well, some people feel that, it's, that the book itself was actually prophetic, that God placed uh, in a man's mind some sense of what the world would be like today. That's, that's an amazing the why, feat. Yeah, that's why amazing people, feat. I think, are interested uh, mm. in the book today. Mm. Mm. Great, yeah. Well, why don't you take us on a little tour? Where, where did it happen? All right. Back in the first century AD, the Roman Empire, we have this little island of Patmos off the coast of what we would call Turkey, mm. Asia Minor. And John was writing this book, this prophetic book, we believe, to these seven churches in the first century. The Roman Empire dominated the whole scene and John was probably a victim of that Roman Empire. Mm. All right. Well, uh, why don't we take a visit to the island of Patmos, uh, where mm -hmm. John was, and uh, show everyone uh, what that was like. Well, John, take us on a tour. Okay, let's All do right. it. Let's have a look. Welcome to our tour of the island of Patmos, the place where John wrote the book of Revelation. Behind me, you can see the beautiful harbor of the island. It's very windy up here at the moment, and we've come through some rough seas to get here. But we also know that life can be rough as well. And we believe this series will help to give hope, meaning and purpose to your life. We're standing here at the entrance to the cave where, according to tradition, Jesus appeared to John, the revelator who passed it on to us. And we've also found out that these three stones here are to represent the Trin Trinity, the Holy Trinity. And right back here, we have the altar where it is claimed the very revelation itself took place. We're inside the Monastery of St. John, which sits magnificently on top of the highest point in the island of Patmos. I'm in front of the chapel, which is a very beautiful place. And uh, the entire monastery here has been placed in honor of the revelation that took place on this island. There is abundant ancient evidence that John was here on the island of Patmos as an exile, uh, imprisoned because of his preaching of the gospel. But frankly, the island of Patmos looks like anything but a prison. 
You have the beautiful blue waters. You have the different shade of blue in the sky. You have the brown and the green of the hills. You often have the white, the bright white of the whitewashed houses that are done in that way to keep the summer's heat out of the interior. Uh, the island of Patmos is a magnificent, almost a magical place. Perhaps no more glorious place uh, would be appropriate for this revelation of Jesus Christ and of the heavenly world to which he calls us. John, but isn't it also true that over the centuries this book has caused a lot of trouble? You know, some people are frightened by this book, aren't they? Well, I think that's very much true and it's very current because people remember the story of Waco, uh, the group there that was studying the book they of Revelation courage. and yeah. uh, ended up uh, 85 people died in a tremendous tragedy. You're probably mm. not aware that uh, the American FBI was actually uh, trying to make contact with me at the time to, to get a little counsel in this matter, but we were never quite able to hook up. But one thing came clear to me at the time and that is that the book of Revelation is important, it's addressing issues that are relevant to us today, yet it can be misused. And so I've developed a series of safeguards uh, that I would like to share with our viewers that I think can help people. In fact, I would argue if David Koresh had studied according to these principles, uh, he would still be alive today. John, I think you should take us through these principles. All right. Very important. I call them safeguards uh, for scripture study. And the very first one is humility. I think when you come to a book of Revelation, like book, book of Revelation, you have to come at it in a humble way, a sense that I don't really know a whole lot. I don't know as much as I would like. If you come to this book feeling like you've got a pretty good handle on life, you're not likely to learn a great deal. But if you come with a humble approach a, uh, that you, you don't trust your opinions about it too much, but there's a lot that can be learned and I think it can be a great benefit to us. Mm, humility is important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A second principle I like to talk about is uh, to be careful about self-deception. Uh, there's a text in the Bible, Jeremiah 17 verse 9 that says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It identifies the fact that I think a lot of people would recognize that there's something inside of ourselves that fools us at times. We can be fooled by ourselves and I think we need to be aware of that possibility as we approach a book like the book of Revelation. Uh, you find 12 people, you might end up with 13 opinions about the book. So when you're coming to a challenging book like that, uh, to be aware of the possibility of deception, to be humble is I think a very important idea. But it's still important that we can understand this book. Yes. Yeah, there is a right and a wrong way to read it. Yeah. Well, the whole yeah. mission of this series of uh, television programs is uh, to bring out the idea that there's much that can be understood and what we can understand can bring, bring tremendous hope, meaning, purpose to our so lives. So the book keeps within itself this idea of how you can read it and understand it. It's within mm. the book itself if That's we stay correct. there. That's okay. correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Another thing that uh, I suggest to people is that it's a good idea as they study the book uh, in the privacy of their own home to, to bring it uh, to God, to uh, pray over the book. And uh, I even suggest to people a, a particular type of prayer to say something along the lines of, I want to know the truth about this book, no matter what it costs me. Mm. Uh, I think truth can be very costly. We've seen that throughout history. We'll see that uh, through this series of programs. Truth can be very costly. It can cost people uh, their reputation. It can cost people their lives. It can cost people their family, uh, their standing in the community. Uh, are you willing to pay that kind of a price? If you are, I think God is willing to share His truth with you. But the rewards are enormous. Absolutely. It's not all lost, lost. There's yeah. huge gain here and later on. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I, I do want to emphasize that we want to keep the cautions in place as we study the book. This is what we will be doing together. Mm. As we work our way through the book, we want to keep in mind that we ourselves need to be cautious. We ourselves uh, can deceive ourselves. So prayer is so important. Yes, that's yeah. right. And, and we have uh, prayed frequently as we have prepared this program. Uh, another aspect I would suggest is to focus on the clear texts 
in the Bible and to, and to look at the broad understanding. And one of the things we hope to do here is to read the book of Revelation in light of the whole biblical context because it's not an isolated book. It's actually kind of like the finale of the symphony. Like the roof on a building. Yeah. 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 It, 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 everything else mm. is necessary as a foundation to what the book of Revelation is teaching. And one of the things we've done is to read broadly through the book. Sometimes people will jump from a text here to text there. And uh, this can lead you to all kinds of destinations. But when you read broadly through a book, when you focus on the things that are clear, uh, then you're not going to end up having problems like uh, David Koresh did. Mm -hmm. Good. So Encouraging. Yeah. Another thing I think can be very helpful is to study it in groups. That, uh, and we invite people uh, as they watch this program to, to gather in groups and to discuss uh, what they have seen because uh, very frequently uh, when people read the Bible, they sometimes read themselves into it. And in a group, you can kind of correct each we other. We correct each other. I've had that happen over and over again. Yeah. Well, as we yeah. were working on the we're script for each this, other. we were correcting each other all the time, weren't we? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I, I feel so much uh, more knowledgeable now because we've had a chance to work it's together. It's been very rewarding. It yes. has. It has. Yeah. So, uh, in addition to that, we want to be conscious as we work our way through the program of being aware of the original recipients. Uh, God did not give humanity this book in the last 10 years. Instead, He gave it almost 2,000 years ago. He gave it in that time and in that place and with a purpose for that time and place. And the more we can understand that, we're going to be visiting Turkey. We're going to be visiting again and again the mm -hmm. island of Patmos and getting a feel for what those places were like, what the people were like, mm. what the government was like, mm. uh, what, what family was life was like. Yeah. What was it that gave them hope, meaning and purpose when life fell apart in the first century? That's right. Yeah, and if we rough. can understand that, yeah. there's a better chance that we can make meaning for ourselves today. Yeah, good. That's great. Yeah. And then finally, Graham, I think you might want to speak to that. Uh, if you don't get a clearer picture of Jesus mm. when you read this book, you probably haven't understood it. That's how the book starts, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A revealing of Jesus. And if we're understanding this book correctly, we're learning more and more about Him. Mm -hmm. It's not about aeroplanes or tanks or guns. Mm -hmm. It's really learning more about Jesus because He really gives us hope, meaning and purpose. And I, I really want to underline what you just said. Uh, it's not an intellectual thing. We may both have doctorates, but I don't think we're coming at it as an intellectual thing here. We are recognizing the fact that uh, this has got to make a difference in practical life. It really ought to change lives. Mm -hmm. I believe it has changed my life and yours too. Yes. And it should be mm -hmm. those who follow this series through. It really should change their life. It should make a person more kind, more loving, more tolerant of other people. There should be some fruitage seen in our life. Yeah. And if some you people have might hope, say, where do the locusts and all that come in? <laughs> well, uh, stay tuned because we're going to go through all that. Whatever it is, <laughs> it's all about learning more about Jesus and changing people in their lives. All right. So we're going to have an exciting time as we work through this book. We're heading to a break right now. And when we come back, we'll take a little bit closer look at John, at uh, the world in which he lived, and how this book uh, came into existence. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about the location in which the book of Revelation was written. On the screen, you'll see a map of the ancient Roman Empire, which is highlighted in red, pretty much surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. Perhaps you recognize uh, some of the modern day countries uh, that are on the Mediterranean, such as Spain, Italy, Greece, and Egypt. To the eastern end of the Mediterranean is the peninsula that we think of as modern day Turkey, which is across the Aegean Sea from Greece. And in the middle of that Aegean Sea is the island of Patmos. And Graham, why don't you read uh, Revelation 1 verse 9, where it tells us exactly where the book of Revelation was written. Sure. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John, we've got fond memories of that place, haven't mm -hmm. we? The That's island right. of Patmos, the journey we had out there, mm -hmm. the sea was rough. I remember you were a little bit 
prophesying, as it were, hey, something's going to go wrong because of the storm you previously had. It can be very rough at times, but when you get there, mm -hmm. it is just so beautiful, isn't it? It is. It is. And uh, the island of Patmos is located off uh, the coast of modern-day Turkey, and here you can see the seven cities to which the book of Revelation was written. It's almost like as if a postman were going to deliver the mail. It's yeah. a route, isn't it? Uh -huh. Really it is, yeah. Patmos yeah. is incredibly beautiful though, isn't oh, it? I the mean, water, uh, the color of the water, yeah. uh, the stillness. Take, take a look at the two shades of blue on that picture. Isn't that amazing? With the, the white. The light blue of the sky and then yeah. the white uh, washed houses yeah. and so forth. Yeah. The harbor of Patmos, uh, absolutely stunning. I could imagine John looking down there at yeah. times. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and there's some little islands just off the coast, uh, sailboat. You can see why people love to come to that area of the world. You That's really right. can. Yes, beautiful. Mm -hmm. John, what do we know about the author? Well, the author's name is John, and uh, the authorship of the book is addressed in the first three verses of the book. And uh, so why don't we read those verses? Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, to show his servants what must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what was written in it, because the time is near. So you see in this opening text, there's kind of an interaction between John and a higher power. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, see what we were talking about when we were on Patmos on that mm -hmm. very subject. I think we went to the very place mm -hmm. where this vision took place. We did, that's right. Yes, yeah. we did. We're standing here at the entrance to the cave where tr according to tradition, Jesus first appeared to John who wrote it the revelation down for us. Behind us we have the altar where it is claimed, according to tradition again, the very revelation itself took place. Now John, how can we be really sure which John wrote this book? Well, the book of Revelation itself doesn't specify. It simply says John. And uh, according to ancient tradition, uh, there were a couple of Johns. One was John the Elder and another was John the disciple of Jesus. Most of the tradition suggests that the John who wrote Revelation was the same one who was called the beloved disciple, uh, the one who was a follower of Jesus and wrote the Gospel of John. Now, as I understand it, when you and other scholars continually refer to John expressed it this way, John reaches out and writes it this way, what you're really saying is that Jesus revealed himself to John in a supernatural way, but according to the language that he could understand and express in his culture. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, when, when we might say at various points during this series, John said this or John wrote this. But uh, we understand that ultimately this book has meaning because it came from God. It's because Jesus himself came down in this place, visited with John, and shared with him things about the future that no human being could possibly have learned on his own. That's why Revelation gives hope, meaning, and purpose to our lives. John, won't you tell us a little bit more now? When was it written? Well, most scholars feel that it was written toward the end of the reign of an emperor named Domitian. And Domitian ruled from about 81 AD to around 96 AD. And people feel perhaps that there was some persecution going on at that time and that Revelation was written in the context of that persecution. We will mention later on in the program, however, that there wasn't a systemic attempt uh, to get rid of Christians in the empire, but rather uh, that tended to happen more locally. One of my fellow lecturers at Avondale College, Dr. Steve Thompson, is an authority on the Greek language and culture of the times. And we've asked him to make a comment, so let's just hear from Steve. Okay. okay. Students of the Book of Revelation for a long time have been really struck by the unusual nature of the Greek language that John used for writing it. And I decided I would give that some detailed study some years ago. I spent some time writing a dissertation on it and later published a book on the unique nature of the language. And what really struck me was that John was, as he reported the visions that he received, he created, he, he structured a language which evoked the language of the great Old Testament prophets uh, before him. Apparently he wanted his readers to think in terms of the message that God gave to the prophets 
and to Israel, to the prophets. So uh, it's amazing how quickly we tune in to just small cues in language. Language is a key to culture and the key to, to a great deal of communication. And just two or three words can tune the mind for what to expect next. For example, if I say, once upon a time, you're immediately ready for what's going to follow. You have an expectation of what's going to follow. If I say, dear John, likewise, I refer to a, a, a form of human communication which leads the listener to anticipate and to sort through the various types of communication that may be appropriate. When John evoked or, or echoed language of the great Hebrew prophets, he would have been telling his earliest readers, sit up, take notice, you are going to now hear a, a continuation, uh, maybe in, in now in the Christian setting, of the way uh, the, the Lord spoke of old to the prophets of ancient Israel. Uh, and the more I study this, the more I realize how the language of the book of Revelation, although very strange Greek, would in a way make very good Hebrew, the language that the Old Testament prophets wrote in. It's as if John's Greek was uh, like a, a, a tent or covering stretched over uh, a, the tent poles or the framework of the Hebrew language. So like the Hebrew language is it. And it must have been very effective for the readers who would have known their Hebrew Bibles. It would have guided their thinking immediately as soon as they read the first two or three words back to this Old Testament passage or that Old Testament passage, especially the prophets, but not only the prophets, other parts of the Hebrew Bible would have come to mind as well. And so in a sense, John in the Revelation is summing and, and bringing into the Christian setting and pointing to the conclusion of the entire message and the entire set of promises that the Lord gave his people through the Old Testament scriptures. Language, Graham, actually is a representation of a people's culture. People think differently. Language expresses their different ways of thinking. Uh, we tend to think logically A, B, C, but actually the ancient Hebrews, uh, which uh, governed the kind of language John was using, they actually thought more A, B, A. I'd like to have on the screen right now a picture of the structure of the book of Revelation, which is structured in seven parts uh, with a prologue and an epilogue. And the first part and the last part, uh, they are very much parallel and so forth, all the way up to the center. Now, logically, we tend to see the climax of a book at the end of the book, but the ancients thought differently. With this chiastic structure, it actually points to the center. And the very center of the book is the key part. And the so, book of Revelation is that way. Yeah, so what you're really telling me is that the climax, the main message is not at the end, because I like to mm -hmm. read the end of the books you know, sometimes. Right. Mm -hmm. But if I want to understand this book, I go to the center to find out right. the main theme. In an ABA mentality, the center often becomes the key. Fascinating. That's the way the book Absolutely Revelation does it. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. But there's an even more important center of the book, isn't there? Mm -hmm. And that's Jesus. Oh, absolutely. If we're understanding this book right, we're understanding Jesus better, aren't we? We really are. And the coming of Jesus back to this world again is a big theme in the book of Revelation. In fact, we have here in the text, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, this theme that we find reoccurring all the time in the book. It says here, Look, He's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him, all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So this book has woven through it the coming of Jesus. Now, we say, how come this book has given hope, meaning, and purpose to all Christians? It's because it holds out the hope of Jesus coming back to this world again. This book starts with the promise, and right across at the end, the very last chapter in chapter 22, verse 7, Behold, I'm coming soon. And then again in verse 12, Behold, I'm coming soon. And again, it says here at the end of the book in verse 20, Yes, I am coming soon. Now, scholars have often seen, John, the, as yourself and others, the strong correlation this has between Jesus and the sermon he gave on the end of the world, which dealt with the time of his first coming to this world, stretching through history to the end of the world, giving hope, meaning and purpose to all generations. And after the break, we're going to explore this, why we believe this is the case.
Welcome back. Before we had the break, we spoke about the close relationship between the sermon that Jesus gave on the end of the world and the book of Revelation. There is a, such a correlation that we're going to explore this sermon for the remainder of this session. And this really sets up the a better understanding of the book of Revelation, don't you think, John? Yes. Because yes, we have all these yeah. events mentioned that Jesus said will be characteristic of the whole age, mm -hmm. which gives relevance to what is happening in our world at this present time. Mm -hmm. And that's why we believe that Revelation gives hope, meaning and purpose for all Christians, but especially for us today. So let's, let's have a look at Matthew 24, verses 1 to 3, where Jesus talks about the sermon of the end of the world. Okay, I'll be happy to read that. Mm -hmm. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The interesting thing here is that they saw the destruction of Jerusalem, which we know now took place in the first century, as being the end of the world. But in hindsight, we can see that there is a mingling of two events, the destruction of Jerusalem in the first century and the end of the world a long while later. Who knows when, but a long, long while later. Yeah, it seems to me the disciples asked one question. You know, when is the city going to fall and the end of the world come? Jesus gave two answers. Yes, he seems to blend the two together. We're uh -huh. going to explain as we go through why he did this. Now, okay. John, as we go through this, uh, let's look at what happened when Jerusalem was destroyed. Would you like to read verses 6 to 8 for us? Sure, I'll be happy to do that. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Interesting, isn't it? Because those Christians who lived in the first century, they saw wars, famines, earthquakes, false Christs, false prophets. Um, they saw all these things begin to happen. And then we know that it, it was a sign to them that J Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. In fact, he actually goes on to say about how they will see the Roman armies surround Jerusalem and this would give them an indication of how they would know that the end of Jerusalem was coming. And you're going to explain this a little bit more later on from the Gospel of Luke, aren't you? Mm -hmm. But sure. those early yeah. Christians, they, they watched what Jesus said. They saw things happening in the empire and round about them and they knew and understood what was going on. And this gave them encouragement, didn't it? Well, you're telling me then uh, Jesus uh, in the sermon described in Matthew 24 is actually predicting things that would happen in their lifetimes? Yes, and unknowns to the, unknown to them uh -huh. beyond their lifetime reaching down to our day too. Uh -huh. Now, these people in Jerusalem, they saw what Jesus had mentioned and they saw the Roman armies surround Jerusalem as Luke brings out. Uh -huh. Uh, when they came there, they, the Roman armies were stepping on holy ground. Now, this is mentioned in Matthew 24, verse uh, 15. Do you like to read that for us, John? Matthew 24 and verse 15. Sure. Let me have a look at your Bible here. Matthew 24 and verse 15. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. The interesting thing is this, that Luke, when he gives his account, talks about this being Roman armies, armies surrounding Jerusalem. That's right. So That's those right. early Christians, they saw all these things happening as Jesus said it would happen. They saw the Roman armies surround Jerusalem. And then... So you think they were buzzing about it right then. They're oh, saying, do you remember what Jesus said? I'm sure. What, what are we going to do now? I am sure it gave them purpose and hope and encouragement when they saw that happen because Jesus said it would happen. What did they do? Jesus said, you've got to flee. Now, that's interesting. How could you flee when the, the armies surrounded it, Jerusalem? Exactly, well, exactly. this is, brings out a big point we're going to make again and again in this series. Mm. Prophecy is best understood when it comes to pass. Jesus said that in John 14, 29. So these early Christians saw it happen just as Jesus said it happened. The Roman armies withdrew from the city. Mm -hmm. The gates of Jerusalem were opened. 
the Jewish army pursued the Romans and there was a great slaughter, but the Christians inside, many of whom were Jewish Christians, saw their opportunity and fled to a nearby town and were, later on when the Roman armies came back, these people were saved from the destruction. Prophecy is reliable. Huh. So you mean yeah. that uh, by paying careful attention to a prophecy, when uh, certain events take place, people can have a handle ahead of time? Prophecy gives hope, meaning and purpose, gives you uh. encouragement. God has seen this. And you have a scholar who, who's an expert in this area, haven't you? Yes, Corbena Duncor is a former student of mine who's now a leading theological scholar from the continent of Africa. And mm. we welcome him to our program. Sure. The issue at stake here has to do with the reliability of biblical prophecy. And in particular, we are concerned about the predictive aspects of prophecy. Whenever I am confronted with this question, I ask myself, why is there an issue at all when the Bible clearly states that God is able to tell the future? The problem is that those who argue against the reliability of prophecy have three arguments. One, that all things should be explained naturally. Two, that God does not communicate with humans directly. And three, even if he does, he cannot speak with us in words. These are all intellectual commitments that these people have made and which do not come from scripture. So if you have a personal belief in a personal God, then you have no problem with predictive prophecy at all. On my part, I believe in predictive prophecy for three reasons. Number one, that the arguments against them are really not solid. Number two, when you think about the prophets and the risks that they had to go through, they must either have been delusional or they truly believe that God had communicated with them. Number three, is the high degree of fulfillment that these prophecies have obtained. And I believe that when you take all these things together, we can depend on biblical prophecy. John, that's so well said. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have put it better. He's an authority and it's good to hear that. You know, we know this prophecy goes not only as far as Jerusalem and its destruction, it also extends down to the end of the world. And the reason we do this is because Jesus in this sermon talks here in Matthew 24 and verse 14. He says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then will the end come. And then he talks about this wicked religious power in verse 15, this abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. And he says, go back and study Daniel. Now, as we go through this series, we're going to see that verses 14 and 15 are really what the last half of Revelation is all about. Mm. There will be a religious crisis over worship. As the gospel goes to the world, there's a reaction against it. And that's why we believe that in this book, we have in Revelation chapter, Matthew chapter 24, and something which affects all Christians throughout all history, and even more so as we get towards the end of time. Because verse eight, Jesus said, you'll see all these wars and famines and earthquakes, all these things happening. And he said, it'll be like a woman expecting a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not a woman, and I have tremendous admiration for the women who have children, mm -hmm. who have birth pains which become say, more and more severe, more and more frequent, more and more severe, more and more frequent until the child comes. And Jesus said these things are going to become more and more frequent, more and more tense as we go through history until he returns. And, you know, it's interesting to notice how history has unfolded here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Wars, famines, earthquakes, do we have them still? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think what I hear you saying is that the reason we're doing these programs, the reason we're encouraging people to study Revelation is that God in some way looking from 2,000 years ago is able to see our day and some of the things that we face and begin to prepare people mm. for what that would be like. Mm. And I think certainly today we can see that there's an intensification of a lot of these things. Wars uh, just seem to be becoming uh, more and more problematic uh, in, in so many places. Uh, we've got AIDS and Ebola, you know, different yeah. types of uh, new types of diseases, yeah. uh, antibiotic resistance, yeah. uh, weapons of mass destruction. And it it's, could it's be a, discouraging. Yeah. It, but if you know that Jesus has seen it before, 
Well, he said it ahead of time. And he said it'll become yeah, even yeah. more so, but be of good courage, mm -hmm. I'm going to get you through. And mm -hmm. the interesting thing is that John doesn't mm -hmm. have this sermon recorded you know, in his gospel. Mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do, and you're going to take us to Luke shortly, but maybe he's thinking that mm -hmm. Revelation is his contribution where we have wars, famines, earthquakes, mm -hmm. and as we get towards the center, the mm -hmm. ultimate false Christ, the ultimate false prophet comes through, and hey, this, this is important for us today to understand, isn't it? So for the sake of our viewers who may not be as familiar, uh, there were four gospel stories uh, which told the story of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Three of them have this sermon that uh, we've noticed in Matthew 24. And uh, Matthew and Mark tell this double story. They're describing the destruction of Jerusalem about 1800 years ago and then uh, expanding on it uh, for the end of time. In the Gospel of John, the story isn't there at all. Mm. And uh, instead, John writes the book of Revelation mm. and uh, in the book of Revelation, we get some of the detail that wasn't there in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But I yeah. wanna talk a little bit about Luke because Luke is a little bit different. Luke is more like Revelation than Matthew and Mark were. It's not simply looking in the future and it's kind of a blank wall and you're saying a little bit here and a little bit there. Uh, Luke actually has a sequence of events and we'll see that in the book of Revelation more often than not that uh, the predictions of the future actually go in a sequence of events, one item following another item. Mm. I'd like to uh, turn to Luke chapter 21 and uh, beginning with verse 20 and I'll be skipping through uh, a few verses here. Uh, verse 20 says, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you'll know that its desolation is near. Now that's what you were talking about earlier. This abomination of desolation in the first century was the Roman army surrounding uh, the city of Jerusalem. At that point, Jesus says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those in the city get out, and let those in the country not enter the city. Verse 24, just moving ahead there, they will fall by the sword and be taken as prisoners to all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Notice the sequence there. Uh, you, you have destruction of the city, uh, then you have a period of Gentile uh, leadership in the world, and then in verse 25 it says, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars on the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. And then finally, verse 27, it says, at that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. I'd like to put on the screen uh, a sequence of five events that occur in the Gospel of Luke that we have seen in these texts. First of all, there are signs of the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, Jesus in Matthew and Mark mingles the signs of Jerusalem's fall with the signs of the end, all right? Mm -hmm. But in Luke, the signs, are they come first, then comes the destruction of Jerusalem, then you have this period, times of the Gentiles, the times uh, when uh, Jews, uh, as we have seen, have been in difficulty all through the last 2,000 years, pretty much. And uh, that it was foreseen by Jesus. Then come signs of the end, and then finally comes the return of Jesus himself. So you see the sequence of five events uh, going in a row. Luke uh, doesn't just throw the prophecy out there kind of two-dimensionally, there's actually it's, it's very three helpful. dimensions. It's in very Luke. helpful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Very helpful because some of these ideas yeah. are taken up in Revelation, aren't they? Yeah. Well, yeah. there's two types of prophecy uh, in the Bible. There's more classical prophecy, which just talks about the future almost two-dimensionally, and uh, you can't really tell what comes first and what comes second. But apocalyptic prophecy, which the Book of Revelation has a lot of, uh, tends to be more sequential. It tends to be more focused in one event happening after another. The book of Revelation is really a blend of both types of prophecy. Uh, we will see when we get to the seven churches uh, that uh, in, a, in a way you could, uh, the, the original receivers could benefit from that tremendously and yet at the same time uh, people throughout the ages have seen it applying to various individuals, various eras Even though of it history. gets rough out there, yeah. yet they can say, but this is how God said it would be yeah. and it gives you purpose and encouragement and hope for That's the future, right. doesn't it? it really but then does. when you get later on in the book of Revelation, you have some more of these sequences of events. As 
we work through these programs, it's going to be exciting to let the text itself speak to us. We're going to have a very exciting time. That's right. But now we have to go to a break. Okay. Welcome back. Uh, would you like to see how people in John's day used to live? Uh, we have some neat shots of some of the homes in ancient Ephesus. Let's have a look. Okay. I'm standing in the terrace houses of ancient Ephesus. Uh, these are largely constructed one or two hundred years uh, before the time when the book of Revelation was written and would have been a major feature of this part of the city at that time. In the ancient Roman world there were two main types of houses for the wealthy. Uh, one type was called the domus and the other was the insula. The domus would be like a private home with a big central courtyard. The insula was sort of like an ancient condominium uh, where a number of families uh, would all construct their houses in an apartment complex and uh, this is one of those. This is an insula type apartment. Now let's imagine that we have uh, a Christian. Let's call him Jason. And he's a Christian Jew. And he's living here uh, in one of these apartments uh, in Ephesus. How would persecution be faced by such a Christian? What would the dynamic be? When you look at the historical records and even the record in the book of Revelation, there's not a lot of evidence that Christians were systematically persecuted at this time. Acts of persecution occurred, but there was no empire-wide systemic uh, sense of persecution at the time. Uh, the reality is that most persecution would have occurred at a local level, perhaps something like this. Let's say Jason is living down here, and on one side uh, is a Jewish neighbor, on the other side is a pagan neighbor. Christians often were sheltered in the fact that Romans saw them as Jews, part of the Jewish faith. And Jews had freedom to practice their religion without worshiping the emperor or doing the civic holidays and so forth. But let's say this neighbor here doesn't get along so well with the neighbors on each side. And maybe his goats get out of the pen now and then and eat up the petunias uh, in front of the neighbor's house. And, and finally this Jewish neighbor just has had enough and he says, I'm going to go to the authorities and let them know he's no Jew. You see? And then... When this Christian's brought in, when Jason is brought in and is challenged in these things, then they say to him, well, if you're not a Jew, what are you? That means you need to worship the emperor. And uh, let's find out if you're actually a true believer in Rome. And so local persecution means that it has more to do with how Christians get along with their neighbors than any governmental attempt uh, to stop Christianity. And so for a Christian... Whether or not to participate in the festivities of his neighbors is a serious issue because if you are seen as antisocial, if you don't get along, a neighbor could very easily have you turned in and you'd face imprisonment or even death. Boy, there was a lot of pressure on people of faith back then. How do, how do you suppose they well, coped with that? Well, people can cope if they know that God is in control and he's caring for them, and he's promised to put his arms of love around to protect them. Of course you can Wait, cope God, if you know that God... God... What? What do you mean God is always in control? He's always caring, always... Love. What about all the children? John, who what, go what, what's going on? Uh, uh, <laughs> This is, this is your wife? Pamela. <laughs> <laughs> She's my wife, and uh, we've sorry, been together we about her. 35 uh, years. Uh, and uh, uh, one thing I've always appreciated about Pamela is that she asks the questions that scholars didn't hear the answers to when they were in school. I'm sorry if I upset her. I mean, yeah, I mean, God is around, and he does promise to care for us and protect us and look after us. And but I want to know, what about all the children who go to sleep at night because they don't have enough to eat, because they've been abused? I know a little bit about that, going to sleep at night because there is physical and emotional abuse. What about the women who've been raped and... Uh, been abused and and what about oh, all those you're women asking and some the children? Tough questions there. You're asking Do you some have tough answers questions. For that? I think Graham. I think the key here is this: when you say that God is in control, uh, it then raises the question: Well, where was He? Yeah. When when right. things happen okay. to people, well, where was He? I think the key here is the issue of trust. Yeah. You but, see, if you trust God 
And if you know he's in control, the combination of those two, I think, is what gives uh, people I a confidence. I can only plead to Pamela, yeah. hear us through, because the next session we're going to show that God is not way out there. He's right here. And then the session after, we've got to see the big picture. So just hear us through, won't you? Okay. All right. And uh, we hope that was a fun way to welcome Pamela <laughs> into our program. Be interesting to see how she handles us in the our material. Welcome back. Uh, we've moved over to the interview part of our set. Uh, chairs are a little bit more comfortable, and I, I think uh, Graham kind of needed that because I, I think he's just a little bit shaken still from uh, what just occurred. And uh, I'd like to reflect a little bit uh, with you, Pamela, because we were talking about persecution, what it was like for the ancient Christians. And, and by the way, people should know, uh, you and I have had conversations like this uh, through the years. And as scholars often can be off in their own world, but I appreciate the common touch that uh, you're going to be I bringing agree. to our I programs, yeah. uh, I think, tremendously. Yeah. And it seems to me that when somebody is living in the ancient Roman world, he's a neighbor in that world, uh, the big issue is how you deal with your neighbors, how you deal with the social life. And uh, I think a crucial aspect of that is rejection. Uh, people, when they feel like they're different, uh, they can often feel rejection and so on. And, and, and Christians, as they were dealing with that rejection, uh, had to find ways uh, to cope with it. Was there ever a time in your experience when you really feel, uh, felt rejection? Yeah, I think uh, there definitely was. And uh, as I recall, through the years, uh, rejection is when I really felt it. It was uh, when my parents divorced. I was only 12 years old at the time. Um, there's five children in my family. And I re remember the day like it was yesterday uh, when my parents divorced. And um, the day that that divorce was final, um, I remember my parents came home from the lawyer and uh, my mom came home into the house. My dad stayed away, but my mom came home with um, she came into the house with the suitcases and boxes and her job then was to pack everything up that she owned and uh, leave. And so the five of us kids watched. And uh, my, my youngest brother was two years old and then the rest of us were like eight, nine, uh, twelve, and thirteen. And, uh, so she brought her suitcases and boxes, like I said, into the house and she packed her clothes from her room and then boxes uh, and packed. I remember she went into the kitchen and took the Tupperware. She had been a Tupperware dealer, so she had lots of that and packed that in boxes and then just took enough of whatever she needed from the kitchen, uh, silverware and plates and pots and pans. I remember you saying she was even dividing up the family pictures. Yeah, you know, she pulled out the picture drawer. How and, did you feel at that moment? Well, you know, it was quite a devastating thing, you know. There were the family pictures and she had to decide, well, half of them would stay and half of them she would, she would take with her and you know, my oldest sister or I were holding the baby and while he was sucking on this pacifier and in diapers and, you know, here we were, had to watch this scene before us and as she's packing things and away. And as you were watching, did you somehow feel responsible for this? Well, I think children often, often think, well, what could I have done differently? Maybe if I would have been a better child, then maybe the parents would have stayed together. Maybe I had something to do with my parents um, divorcing. Mm -hmm. I think often people, uh, children do take responsibility for these things. It's as if, if I had been a better child, uh, maybe this wouldn't have happened mm -hmm. and so forth. And I, I know from experience that in many ways this has marked Pamela's life. And, and uh, even to this day at times, uh, she can tear up in, in telling this story. You're probably wondering, what does this have to do with the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation speaks to people 
who have felt rejection, people who have suffered. Uh, let me share with you Revelation chapter 1 and parts of verses 5 and 6. It says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. You know, I recognize that sometimes God can seem distant at times like this, difficult. But when you come to understand over time, and over the next couple of sessions, uh, uh, we're going to try to do that, to come to discover that God really cares deeply, to come to discover that God hurts with us when we hurt, and He has made us kings and priests. That means to the rejected ones, they feel cast down. They feel like they're not worth anything. And to them, God says, I'm raising you up to the highest imaginable status in this world. And as we come, begin to think in those terms, we can begin to deal with the rejection that I think all of us have experienced uh, in one way or another. Graham? I agree, John. And I've been really moved by Pamela and what she has said. And I'm sure there are many who've been watching this program who, who feel and identify with Pamela. It was a moving experience. And there are others out there who've gone through similar experiences, not exactly the same, but some may have felt rejected. Uh, some have been abandoned by their parents and some are out there, as Pamela has said, are hungry. Some out there are very, very lonely. And we want to encourage you that this book of Revelation does give you hope and meaning and purpose. You find your, your identity by understanding that God is there. He is in control of your life and of history. And we want to make this very clear throughout this whole series. And we want to thank you also for watching Hope Channel and watching this program of Revelation, Hope, Meaning and Purpose. Our very next session coming up is going to deal with how God has been involved in our lives, in our history. Right from chapter 1, we go to see He has not been way out there as a bystander watching. He's come down here in a very meaningful way to build hope, meaning and purpose in your life and my life. Thank you once again for watching and we'll look forward to being with you again in the very next program. If you've enjoyed this presentation on the Book of Revelation and would like more information, visit www.revelationhope.com. You can purchase your own DVD set of this series or the booklets which cover the content of each program.